So here's the thing about hope, is that with hope, like uh, Aaron mentioned, it's trusting that something will be better. It's trusting that um, in something and, and improving in something. And without something negative, there's nothing to hope in. So without something that you struggle with, without something that's there and a challenge and a difficulty, uh, without those things, there's nothing to hope in. And it becomes worthless and, and, and hope means nothing. And so we're going to look real quick at what Scripture says about hope. But we're going to do it in a place that most people wouldn't really think to look to when we talk about this issue of hope and, and hoping in something. So if you have your Bibles, which I know most of you guys don't really carry your Bibles because, you know, it's 2018, people don't tend to do that anymore. Um, I do think it's really important to read this along with who's ever up front. And so if you would turn in your phones to Philippians chapter 4. And we're going to start in verse 4. I need to pull this up. That awkward moment when you don't have your notes ready on your phone because you did it on your computer. All right, so let's stand in honor of Lord, the Lord and His holy word. And we're going to all look at this together. And starting in verse 4, Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord adds his blessing to the reading of his word. You can all be seated. So, so often in our culture and in our world, we tend to have this idea that money is what destroys hope. And ultimately, that's what kind of has led to that culture is people have this mindset that, oh, because I have all of this, therefore I should have hope because I have more than this other person. And they almost make it a comparative game. And hope isn't about comparing what we have in comparison to someone else. It's in comparing for what God has done for us in our own lives. And it should not be a game about you and others. And so this isn't going to be a sermon focused on this issue of being thankful. We're going to talk about being thankful because I think it's important, but that's not going to be what the entire focus is on. When we look at the book of Philippians, can anyone tell me who was the audience? And yes, I want audience participation. Who was the audience in the book of Philippians? Faith. The saints at Philippi. Wow, I was going to ask a follow-up question, but that covers everything. The saints at Philippi. So what that means, also you cheated and that's not fair. The saints at Philippi are people who are saved who attend the church in the city of Philippi which the city of Philippi at this time had actually uh, really struggled with a lot of economic issues. So these people, these saints at the church at Philippi, they were poor, insanely poor. Even for that time period, they were poor. They were people who were under great persecution by the people around them. And they were people that were struggling with internal sins within their own congregation, within their own people that Paul addresses. And the entire book of Philippians is about a theme about rejoicing in trials. Because scripture never says that it's based on our trials that we find joy. One of the things that we have to do is a lot of people in this world, they try to find happiness. Here's the problem with happiness is happiness is reactive, meaning your happiness is going to change based on your circumstances. So for example, your parents buy you a new car. Yay, you're happy. All of a sudden you wreck that new car. You realize you don't have gas money for that new car. Or all of a sudden you have to pay for your own insurance. You're no longer happy that your parents bought you that new car. Happiness is reactive. And that's what our culture is striving for. It's what our culture is going for. Joy is not reactive. Joy is ever-present. Joy isn't based on your circumstances. It's not based on your trials. It's not based on the good or the bad. Joy is found in what we cannot lose. So I don't know about you guys. When we go after what is it we're looking for that makes us happy, that changes and, and ebbs and flows, and what brings us joy, I'd rather go for what's lasting, what's always going to be there. Uh, for example, I used to really, really not like coffee. I still don't like coffee. I also used to really not like tea. And then I married Caroline, and now I like tea. All that being said is our taste changed. Things that used to make you happy don't make you happy anymore. And I know you guys have all seen that in your own life. How many of you guys have seen that with friendships? Or you're dating someone, and for a long time, they make you so happy, and then all of a sudden, they just don't make you happy anymore because happiness changes. But here Paul is coming back and he's saying to the church, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. 
He's saying have joy. Your goal is not to find happiness. Your goal should be to find joy. How do you find joy? Be anxious for nothing, verse 6, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through the Lord Jesus Christ. So he talks about this issue of thanksgiving. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We live in a culture where we talk about thanksgiving in the sense of compared to what other people don't have, you should be thankful. Paul's coming to a group of people who have nothing, and he says, you should be thankful. It's not a comparison game. It doesn't matter if you come from an insanely rich family or an insanely poor family. It doesn't matter if you come from a background of all your needs were met and all your, or all your needs weren't met. We should be able to rejoice. We should be able to be thankful for what we have. I didn't know this all growing up. I actually grew up really <laughs> with a lot of not money. Um, I didn't know this till I was older, but most of our Christmases, my parents couldn't afford like Christmas presents. But every year, someone in the church would give us Christmas presents. Uh, I didn't have any older siblings, but I lived off hand-me-downs until I was like 12 or 13, uh, just because random people in the church would give me clothes up until I was taller than everybody. And we, I never knew we were poor, but that's partially because what my parents taught was thankfulness. And again, it wasn't this, this combative, oh, I'm thankful because that person has less. It was thankful because God has provided. And I do think when it comes to having joy, thankfulness is so key to that. Because whether we have nothing, whether we have something when it comes to this world, we all have been given something. And we're going to talk about that. Lay your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So what is this peace that surpasses all understanding? How is it that you're able to have a peace in a world that is crazy? Let's face it, we live in a crazy world. Uh, we live in a world where we don't know if North Korea is going to try to send off any more nukes and mess with us. We live in a political climate where everyone's just yelling at each other, everyone's calling each other racists and bigots, and uh, everyone hates each other, it seems like. And we live in this you know, church climate where <laughs> how on earth has everything in, in a lot of the areas of culture been desegregated but the church? And we live in this, this world where you go to school and you have friends and you get stabbed in the back and then all of a sudden everything that you thought you could hold to shatters and there's this, this world of insanity or your parents get a divorce and everything you knew shatters. Uh, a relationship breaks up that you thought was going to go somewhere and everything seems to shatter. Mom or dad gets sick and they can't work and all of a sudden you have to change the way you live or you get sick and all of a sudden you have to change the way you live. Life happens. Life-shattering things happen. I know one thing that, you know, part of the reason with Jules and I were so close is I was really close to her mom. And when, when she passed away at a, at a young age, um, her name was Rhonda. And she was someone who I really, really cared about. Um, but we've all lost people who we care about. We'll continue to lose people that we care about. And in the mess of that, how do we find a peace that surpasses all understanding? And it says it right here. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, we've all been growing up in the church. Most of us, anyway, have lived in Christian homes, and we've been brought up in the church. And like Tanner mentioned last night, uh, we have this viewpoint of Jesus where we've all been hearing about him since, you know, we were in kindergarten. But have we really stopped to look at who Jesus was in a, while, in a, in a long time? How many of us have focused on the gospel? So let's take a quick second and, and do an overview of who Jesus was. Jesus was born of a virgin. Can you guys name anyone else who's ever been born of a virgin? No, it's never happened because that was a miracle. Jesus was born of a virgin, which is something that showed that he was special. Jesus was something to be looked at, something to notice. And then he lived a sinless life. I'm going to challenge you guys after the dare conference to go an entire hour without sinning. And we, you know, sinning is anything you think, anything you say, or anything you do that displeases God. If you can go an entire hour without thinking anything, saying anything, or doing anything that displeases God, please teach me your secret, because I know I don't have that ability. Uh, how many of you guys go home to annoying siblings and you say something that displeases God? Let's face it, it happens. But Jesus lived an entire sinless life without sin. He ministered to others. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He had the lame to walk and the blind to see. And he did all of those things again to show that he was special. And then I went through last night and I reread the Gospel of Matthew, at least the portions when it comes to the crucifixion. So you have this man who's God. He's fully 
God, yet fully man. And in Hebrews, it talks about how we don't have a high priest who does not sympathize with our weaknesses. Guys, Jesus knows. Jesus struggles with all the same things we do. Jesus had relationships that were broken. His own brothers hated him. People turned against him. His best friends denied him three times. He struggled with the same temptations. He struggled with the same difficulties. I'd be hard-pressed that at points throughout his ministry, Jesus was tempted by thoughts of suicide. And I think that's scriptural. Jesus had faced uh, an enemy where Satan knew if he was able to cause Jesus to sin, the entire redemptive story was over. Jesus would no longer be a suitable sacrifice for our sins if Jesus had sinned. So I would go as far as to say that Jesus was tempted by every single sin that Satan has ever tried to tempt anybody with, ever. So whereas this room was divided by people who maybe struggled with certain things and people who maybe didn't, I think Jesus struggled with everything. I think those temptations were there and they were present. And so Jesus understands. Jesus understands pain. So the night before he was to be crucified, he lived again a sinless life. He knew he was going to be betrayed because people hated him. <laughs> it's just what happened when, you know, at the time they hated Jesus. He knew he was going to be betrayed and he prayed before the Lord because he knew the difficulty that awaited him. And he, he asked the Lord, if it be your will, remove this cup from me but not my will, but yours be done. When it comes to hope, it doesn't always mean that we're going to get what we want in this life. God didn't get what he wanted as Jesus. God the Son, Jesus didn't get what he wanted in this life. He was asking God to remove the cup of what would happen at the crucifixion because it was, it was painful, it was hard, it was difficult, and God didn't remove that. How many times in our lives have we asked God to remove a cup from us? Take away a difficulty of a broken family. Take away the difficulty of a lost loved one. Take away the difficulty of uh, a medical issue or the difficulty of, of struggles. You want to talk about difficult, you know, difficult medical issues. Abe has a spinal injury that will never get better. All he can do is continue to work out to prevent it from getting worse, and he will always have constant back pain. And we may ask God, and I know even Caleb mentioned when he gave his testimony, I asked God during that time period to take, to give me my sight back. And God has chosen not to remove that cup yet. But even here, when Jesus was crying out to God, and he was saying, remove this cup from me, but not your will, but my, uh, not my will, but yours be done. And then they came, they collected Jesus. And the next X number of hours of his life within the next day, with some of the most painful hours that a human can possibly go through. They have this thing called the cat of nine tails. And the cat of nine tails was literally just like a whip. And it's not like an Indiana Jones whip that crackles, because those hurt too. It was a whip that had these, these nine tails that went off. And within, woven within the tails, they had pieces of pottery and clay, and they had pieces of stone that were sharp, and they would wrap them around a human being, and then they would yank it out, and it would take chunks of skin and rip it out of the human flesh. How many of you guys have ever gotten a hangnail and tore your hangnail? Now imagine that sting over a constancy of your entire body, and it was 39 times. And in those 39 times, the reason they stop at 39 is because at 40, they proclaim a person dead. Beyond the cat of nine tails, they also beat him, they whipped him, they mocked him, they would spit into his face. And this whole time, he was given strength by God to continue on because Jesus was a man. He struggled with the difficulty of exhaustion and knowing, not knowing where the strength for the next step would come from. And then they took him, an innocent man, who had never done anything wrong, and they hung him on a cross between two thieves. How crucifixion works is they, they put you up in such a way where you can't breathe without lifting up. And eventually, if you, you start to lose exhaustion, uh, you can't lift up anymore because you don't have the strength to and you suffocate. So it's kind of like drowning, except it takes a lot longer, and it's painful. Because your body slowly starts to collapse as you start losing oxygen, and crucifixion was a horrible, horrible, obscene way that sinful men had thought to take the lives of other men. And what was amazing when Jesus died is there were, again, signs. When Jesus passed away, there were several things that happened that were huge, and we missed them. One of the big things that happened is the veil was torn. We sing a song about how the veil was torn. 
This is not like a wedding veil. I think a lot of times when we think of the word veil, we think of this little froofy white thing that's all nice and pretty, and you know, it just kind of goes back. This veil was about 30 feet tall, several feet thick, and it separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. And the Holies of Holies was a place that could only be entered in once a year by the high priest who had been cleansed. Jesus tore the veil. No longer was it necessary to go through the customs that had been in place to come into the holies of holies, the presence of God, because Jesus wiped that out. We are now able to enter into the presence of God because of what Jesus did. What also happened when Jesus died is dead men who who had fallen asleep, who had died, rose up and started walking around and talking to people. Could you imagine if like someone who had died started talking to you? You'd be like, wow, this is crazy. But that's what happened when Jesus died because the moment he died was such a powerful moment. Dead men rose from the grave. But then also there was an earthquake that shattered the earth. Such a violent shaking of an earthquake, it broke rocks. And because of all these things that had happened, there was a centurion, a Roman guard sitting there who said, truly, this was the Son of God. Now you guys might be thinking, okay, Brandon, you've told us all these things about Jesus that are really depressing. How does any of this have to do with hope? And you're right. At this point in the story, there really isn't a lot of hope. Because if it had ended there, then was Jesus really who he claimed to be? One of the things that I studied a lot in school was world religions. I was a history major. I care about what the world believes in as far as all over the world. And never have I studied about a risen savior, a risen dude. Muhammad is dead. Joseph Smith is dead. Buddha, Gandhi, whoever it may be, they're dead. Jesus is alive. Because what happened three days later was Jesus rose from the grave. Guys, when Jesus rose from the grave, he didn't just take our sin and our death, but he took our shame. And by dying on the cross and raising from the grave, Jesus was not only who he claimed to be in being the Son of God, but Jesus also adopted you into his family. Through belief in Jesus Christ, you are now a child of God. Again, I emphasize the tearing of the veil. You can enter into the presence of God. And then when Jesus ascended, he left his Holy Spirit to be in our lives and to to continue to be with us even when he went away. And now for anyone who believes in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells within them. So what does that have to do for the church of Philippi? Again, let's go back and look at this. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. All right. They're probably sitting there reading this letter. And uh, that's kind of like if you write a Facebook message to a friend or Instagram, I guess. Can you write messages on Instagram? My brother's made me get an Instagram, and I've posted like twice, and I think I know how to check it, but I don't really know. But it's like getting a message. So I know back when I was in high school, uh, we would always talk to each other through Facebook. So when there was something difficult going on in our lives, we'd write a Facebook message, and we'd send it off. It's like sending a Facebook message to a friend, and all they do is respond. They say, dude, don't worry about anything that you're going through because of this. Your first thought is like, what are you talking about? But here Paul is completely, I don't want to say ignoring the situation of the church of Philippi, but Paul is coming back and he's telling this group of people who are being killed for what they believe, they have no money. <laughs> they're insanely poor and they're dealing with internal strife, people stabbing each other in the backs and, and difficulty in argumentation. He's saying, be anxious for nothing. And then he comes back and he says, why? He says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Guys, the hope that we have is not in what God provides for us. The hope that we have is not that a disease or a sickness will go away. My friend Caleb may never see in this world, but the next thing he'll see is the glory of Jesus because he has hope that Christ has saved him from his sins. Some of you guys may have difficulty in different things. Maybe you struggle with depression or the thoughts of suicide. And man, those are real, real struggles that we face in this world. And I don't want to be one of those people that just says Jesus is the answer, but here's the thing. We have a hope that even if it may not directly address with that and how we're feeling, Jesus is alive. And when Jesus rose from the grave and claimed he was who he claimed to be, he put a value on human life as the creator of the universe that life has value. And we have a hope in that. Even if you may never be loved by anyone in your entire life, God loves you. He sent his only son to die for you. 
and through belief, we can achieve the gift of eternal life. That was the second thing I noticed as I studied world religions. In every single world religion, and really there's three types of religions in this world. There's the religion that doesn't believe in a God. Uh, for those of you who have been told the idea of atheism is new, there were atheists in ancient Greece. Uh, there were atheists in ancient Rome. Man, atheism is as old as dirt. You know, people have been ignoring and disbelieving in God ever since sin has crept into the world. So atheism is not new. There's the belief that there is no God. The second is the belief that man can become right with God by doing all the right things. Uh, that's Islam. Islam believes in the five pillars of Islam. As long as you do those five pillars, Allah will be happy with you and you'll go to heaven. Uh, you have all these other world religions. Hinduism is eventually, and in Buddhism, you're trying to reach nirvana by doing all the right things. And nowhere is there a religion where God has sought to be right with man, to make man right with God. Never is there a religion where we are saved by grace alone. And here's why, is because Satan is really good at making us think that we have to do something to achieve grace. If we have to do something to achieve grace, where is the hope in that? There is no hope in that. All these other things that you could possibly believe have no hope because they end the same in death. The story of the Bible, the story of Jesus Christ doesn't end in death. It ends in life. And with new life brings hope. And with hope, it applies to us in our everyday lives because we have been given value as people who have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I know I never really struggled with depression all growing up. Um, I struggled a lot with loneliness. And it's funny because uh, some of you guys are maybe like this where you don't like to talk about your problems. I went years and didn't tell anyone my problems about anything. And around my junior, senior year of high school, I started to get a lot of friends and people would have considered me popular. And um, man, I had kids in the bathroom at TCA telling me I was famous. And I still have no idea who that kid was, but um, I still felt lonely. I went off to college, and again, same thing. I was well-known on campus. People knew who I was, and I still felt lonely. Guys, Satan's really, really good at making you believe lies that are not true. God is really good at making you believe the truth that you are loved. So even if you may feel alone in a situation, I know I've been there, and I promise you Jesus has been there. Even if you feel alone in that, whether it be the addictions that we talked about, whether it be the the difficulty of depression, anxiety, suicide, lying, uh, homosexuality, whatever your battle is, whatever your struggle is, we're not alone in that because Jesus is alive. And Jesus being alive, we have a hope for today, we have a hope for tomorrow. And guys, you in this life may never be healed. I already mentioned Caleb may never be healed. Um, I have people tell me all the time, I mentioned I was diagnosed with a chronic disease, I have people tell me all the time, if you just believe hard enough and you, you cast out that demon that's crippling you, then you'll be healed. I just don't think that's true. Because here's the deal, my hope is not in a body that works in this life. Because that might never happen. If we were promised that we'd have whatever we wanted in life from God, then Jesus never would have gone to the cross. But guys, Jesus went to the cross. And because of that, we have hope for a better life. So Caleb may never see in this life, but one day he will see in a, in a new body because Jesus is alive. I may never feel rest again in this earth, but that doesn't matter because one day I will feel the rest that is promised by God because Jesus is alive. And I know one day Juliana will be reunited with her mother because Jesus is alive. So I want everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. And no looking around, and I'm one of those people that I strongly believe there's two types of people in this world. There's people who have surrendered to the hope in knowing that Jesus is alive and have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And then there's those who have not. And in this room, we'd be ignorant to think that all of us are on one side of that. So I want to encourage you. If you're someone, you've heard about Jesus your entire life, and maybe during this conference, God has really just pulled on your heart and you know you need to become right before the Lord, I want to encourage you to surrender. I want to encourage you to cry out to God and seek that hope that we have in Him. And there's not going to be an invitation. I'm not going to ask anyone to raise your hands. But right there in the seats where you are, 
I want you to pray and ask God to save you. Find that hope that is found in, in God and the joy from the resurrected Savior. The second kind of person are people in this room who are believers and they have found that hope. And of those, you have people who are not willing to stand. They're not willing to reach. And frankly, some of us are not willing to hope. And when I met Caleb, I was at that point where I had almost lost hope. So I get it. I know some of you are at that point where you have ready to lost hope. And I want to just encourage you to ask God to again give you the hope that can only be found through Jesus Christ. That can only be found through a resurrected Savior. Because Jesus is alive. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I know I am not worthy to proclaim your word, but Lord, you have revealed yourself to us through your word and through the scripture, but you've also revealed yourself to us through your son. And Lord, we want to thank you that we are able to find a peace that surpasses all understanding through what Jesus has done on the cross, through his death, his burial, his resurrection. And Lord, we want to thank you that Jesus is alive. Lord, we want to thank you that Jesus has shown his love for us and that we are able to have hope that is found through Christ. Lord, I do want to pray for those who are here. I pray for those who may be struggling to know you, who, who are doubting. Lord, I just want to pray that you would show yourselves to them. That regardless of the circumstances, Lord, that you would just reveal yourself to them and that they would see that you are not only true and alive, but that you are the hope of this world. I pray, Lord, for those who have been encouraged. I pray that you would just help us as a group of believers to stand for truth, to reach to a world that is lost, and to hope in you and, and find hope in our risen Savior. Lord, I just want to personally thank you publicly for how you have given me a peace that surpasses all understanding through a life that doesn't make sense, through a life that isn't fair, and through a life that is difficult and full of challenges. I want to thank you for how you have shown that to me. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us moving forward, that we would continue to seek for that hope and that joy that is found in you that cannot be found in the things of this world. I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.